this is probably the most difficult time slot. First talk in the afternoon, right after you've eaten and feel like taking a little nap and digesting your food, so I'm going to try to keep you awake. About 30 years ago, I was living here at Mount St. Michael. This was in the mid-80s before the sisters moved into the east wing of the building, before our seminary moved to Omaha. And we had, because the seminary was here, we had a large number of brothers, seminarians, a few priests living here at the Mount. And one day the brother, who was his turn to answer the phone, came to me with a message. He said a woman called and wanted a priest to come and give the sacraments to her dying mother. And that was about all I knew, an address, etc. So I went there in Spokane, actually not too far from here, north side of Spokane. And the mother was an Indian woman, Native American, probably in her mid-80s. And so before I would give her the sacraments, I wanted to find out how well trained, how well educated she was. I began to ask her some questions about church doctrine, etc. She knew all the prayers. She knew all the answers. And I was amazed at how well informed she was of our faith. And of course, gave her the sacraments. What was interesting about this is that she told her daughter, I want a priest from Mount St. Michael. Now at that time, we had had several years before, a lot of bad press, and so there was a stigma attached more so than there is today to the name Mount St. Michael. But she insisted to her daughter, I don't want you to get a priest for me from one of the local parishes. I want a priest from Mount St. Michael, knowing that we are traditional Catholics. And so then I thought to myself, well, why is that? Why is it that she insisted on a Latin mass priest, let's use that terminology, on a traditional priest, and that she knew her faith so well. And the credit goes to all of the religious and the priests who worked in the various missions among the Native Americans throughout the Rocky Mountain region and the plains. And all of that goes back more than anyone else after God and our Blessed Mother, the credit goes to one man. And that would be Father Pierre John de Smet, who is from Belgium. Well, a few years after this incident with this elderly Indian woman, I came across this book, The Life of Father de Smet, written by Father Levy, a Jesuit, and read the book and became I would say, engrossed in the story, just fascinated. One of those books that's a real page-turner, hard to turn down. And In fact, I was so thrilled with the book, I read it through three times. And then, as Father Anaya mentioned, a few years after that, a couple years later, I was in Omaha, so I had the chance to go to St. Louis. So I contacted in advance the archivist. Now, the archivist for the Jesuit province of St. Louis would be the priest that's in charge of the archives. And I said, I'm really taken with the life of Father Desmet, and I would like to be able to look at whatever archives you have of this, this great priest, this great missionary. So we went there, we visited his grave, but I went into the archives and he gave me free reign for a couple hours to look at maps drawn by Father Desmet, ledgers, in which he recorded every penny of expenditures. It was very interesting for me. As you know, we're celebrating this year the centenary of Mount St. Michael. And that is why our final three lectures today deal with the Jesuit missions, with Mount St. Michael in particular, with the Catholic history of the Northwest. And again, for the most part, it goes back to this one man, Father DeSmet. And I also wanted to give a talk about him because of the terrible injustice that has been done to his reputation, sadly, at St. Louis University, where he was once a professor. Uh, you might have seen this in our World Watch section of the Reign of Mary, the last issue, that in May, a statue of Father DeSmet was taken down because it was offensive to the more liberal faculty 
faculty and some of the students. And this is what they claimed, that the statute depicts a history of colonialism, imperialism, racism, and of Christian and white supremacy. And that was their explanation for why they insisted that the authorities of the university remove the statue, which was done, sadly. And I'll show you a picture of that statue uh, towards the end of this lecture. So, again, I would like to tell you a little bit about Father DeSmet. I very much recommend the book about his life. As I said, it's fascinating. He was, he was a giant, a great man, a heroic man, one of those unique individuals that come from time to time in history and use the grace of God given to them to accomplish a great deal of good. Well, Father de Smet was born in 1801 in Belgium, and he went to a couple different preparatory seminaries, and eventually, when he was 20 years old, a missionary priest from Kentucky, who had been from Belgium, went back to Europe to try and recruit uh, missionaries. And he went around to the different seminaries and different universities and gave a talk about the need for vocations in the new world. And the young Pierre Jean de Smet was one of those who volunteered. And Father de Smet, as well as the other young men in his group that became Jesuits, made a difficult decision. They knew that their families would oppose their vocation or their intention to go to the new world and so they left without even saying goodbye. They decided to write letters to their families. And of course, that may seem to be very um, inconsiderate and even cruel. But we recall the words of our Lord, who said, anyone who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Now, Father DeSmet had an extraordinary father. This man had been married the first time, bore seven children, and then his wife died. And when he was 56 years old, he married again and had nine more children, one of whom was Pierre John de Smet, a twin, had a twin sister, and a very good Catholic man. As a matter of fact, people refer to him as Honest de Smet because of his reputation for honesty as a, a very good man. But Father de Smet's mother, this Jean de Smet's second wife, had passed away when he was about 18. And so here he was, 20, feeling very strongly the call of God to go to the new world, and he knew that his father would oppose it. And so he made that decision that he had to leave without taking leave of his father, and he simply wrote a letter. So when he, is, he and his companions came to Maryland, and they became part of the nucleus of this Jesuit uh, novitiate in Maryland. Well, after two years there, the Bishop of New Orleans asked the superior for missionaries to go west. There was a tremendous need, and St. Louis at that time was like a little village, not the bustling city it is today. And so these group that volunteered, I think there were eight of them, they went with one priest to St. Louis. They erected their Jesuit home there. They started schools for the Indian boys in the area, and they started St. Louis College, which eventually became known as St. Louis University, Jesuit school. Father de Smet, for a while, was the professor of English. Now imagine that accomplishment being from, from Belgium, to have mastered the English language so well that he was the professor of English in this university. He was also the treasurer. After a while, he worked so hard in the missionary works um, among the schools for the Native Americans that his health broke. And so the superiors sent him back to Europe for a year or two, and of course that was very discouraging for him. But after a while, his health revived. He returned to St. Louis and was continuing his labors. Now about this time, this is in the 1830s. During this time, he was ordained in 1827, and I'm not sure he went back to Europe around 18, 1832 or thereabouts. But in the 1830s, there were four delegations of Indians from the tribe, what we would call the Salish Indian tribe, which would be western Montana. And the French fur trappers, 
who are the ones who named all the Indian tribes in this area, called them the Flatheads, which was really mis a mistaken uh, name for them. At any rate, this tribe included a man, included several Indians whom they adopted. And those Indians were Iroquois, Mohawks. So let me give you a little of the story. 200 years before, around 1640, the Mohawks martyred St. Isaac Jogues and his two companions, as well as up in Canada, the other five of the North American martyrs. And later, you know the old saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the faith. Later, the Iroquois nation as a whole was converted and really embraced the faith. But as the white men began to move westward and they lost their original homeland, many of them migrated farther westward. So now we come to the early 1800s when a Catholic Indian by the name of Ignatius settled among the Flatheads, the Salish Indians in Montana. They adopted him into their tribe and he told them these wonderful stories about God, about Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, about the Catholic religion, and about the, the uh, black robes, the great black robes who could teach them the way to heaven. And he kept saying to them, you have to get a black robe. If you want to get to heaven, you need to get a black robe to come here and tell you how to get there. Just, just an amazing story. So they took this to heart. And this man, this Iroquois man who is now adopted in their tribe, Ignatius, they called him Old Ignace. He loved the faith so much that he persuaded them that so much so that they desired to do whatever it took to get a black robe. Well, they knew that the, the settlement farthest west of the United States at that time was St. Louis. It was the, the city, the town that was farthest to the west. So they sent a delegation. The delegation came back empty-handed. They went to St. Louis. Nobody knew their language. Nobody knew what they wanted. And they came back empty-handed. They sent four different delegations on this 3,000-mile trip by foot. 1,500 miles each way. And the fourth one Father DeSmet found out about. He was now back, and he heard of this in 1840 and asked his superiors for permission to go with them to return to their people which he did and in fact when he left he was suffering from a fever but he went anyway and got better as the trip went on so he went with them arrived in Wyoming where an advance guard of the uh, tribe met him had mass there the first mass in Wyoming and then he went on up to Montana and, of course, travel in those days was very different from what it is now. Not only insofar as your means of conveyance, but they would travel by the rivers. Because, you know, when we're, when we're in a car and you're going somewhere, sometimes you don't even know when you crossed over a river. But imagine the difficulties of travel when there were no bridges at all and sometimes very wide rivers. So they would often travel along the rivers. At any rate, Father DeSmet finally came in the end of the summer, maybe August, early September, to a place we call Three Forks, Montana. So our Montanans here know exactly where that is, the place where the three tributaries of the Missouri River join to form the Missouri. And he traveled that far, and he began to realize it was still another several hundred miles, maybe another four or five hundred miles, maybe not that many, several hundred miles, to their village. And he decided, these Native Americans are so receptive, I need to go home to go back to St. Louis and procure more missionaries and supplies. He also realized that if he was going to be successful in Christianizing these people, he had to convert them from a nomadic way of life to an agrarian life. Have them settle down, choose an area, build a church, build a homes, a settlement, teach them how to farm. So we had to procure seeds and plows and different things that would be needed, a grist mill and so forth. So he made that decision. He went back to St. Louis alone. He arrived at the end of that year, uh, late December of 1840, cold, wet, but very happy. 
very happy to have experienced the uh, the openness, I would say, to grace of these Native Americans. So he went to his superiors, and then his heart sank. They said, we have no money to give you to procure what we need. We can't spare any religious. And so then he went that winter on a begging trip. Now, the railroads did reach St. Louis by that time. So he went to New Orleans, to Philadelphia, to different cities, and he raised money and also obtained a couple of uh, other priests. And then the next year went back and founded St. Mary's Mission. St. Mary's Mission uh, is now called, or the village, the town there is called Stevensville, Montana, which is a half hour south of Missoula. But that was the first uh, settlement in the state of Montana and really this entire area. So he founded this mission, stayed with the Indians for a couple years, and then realized they needed more supplies. He went back again. Now he started to go back and forth to Europe. He made, all told, 19 post-Atlantic uh, uh, trips there and back would be, what, nine trips there and back plus his original trip coming. Total 19 trips across the Atlantic in the days when it took two or three months maybe, at least, at least a month and a half on very uh, difficult travel conditions, unsanitary conditions and so forth. But all of that was nothing for his zeal. So he continued to return to Europe many times to beg for money and for vocations. He brought many of the priests who came to this area. You've heard of names like Father Rivali, Father Cataldo, different priests were recruits that he obtained from his various trips to Europe. I originally had thought that Father DeSmet simply moved to the Rocky Mountains, lived among the Indians for his life, and is, was responsible for starting all of these missions. And again, that was not the case. He was the founder, and he did all of these trips. He would go back and forth to the Rocky Mountains a number of times, but he eventually settled in St. Louis and stayed there and spent the last 20 years or so of his life just living in St. Louis and being the procurator for the missions and, again, obtaining missionaries, etc., Various other tribes, after he started St. Mary's Mission, found out about the fortune of the Salish Indians to have the great black robe. And they wanted a black robe. So there would be these various delegations that would go to St. Mary's and would ask for missionaries and the, the faith and so forth. And so he began all of these other missions with the Coeur d'Alene's, the Kalispells, the Spokane's, all of these different tribes. These were all Jesuit missions started by these, these great Jesuit missionaries. Uh, Father DeSmet was this great missionary, but like all saints and holy persons, he also had to suffer a lot. When he would go to Europe, there were those who accused him of exaggerating the benefits just to try to get recruits, uh, of misstating the real condition, etc. There's always those who were carping and criticizing, etc. And he was a very sensitive man, and this hurt him deeply. But nevertheless, he persevered in all of the good works that he did for the foundation of the missions. So I think we have to, here as we celebrate Mount St. Michael's, founded by Father Cataldo, by the Jesuit order back before when the Jesuits were truly solid and devout Catholic men, good priests, etc. We have to give a lot of the credit to Father Pierre John de Smet. Now, his um, ability with the Indians was known not only among the Indians and among the whites, but it was also known to the American government. His services were enlisted several times because the government wanted to, to contract a treaty with the Indians, but the Indians wouldn't trust anyone else. Father DeSmet was the only man that Chief Sitting Bull trusted. He died, unfortunately, Father DeSmet in 1873, three years before uh, the Custer's last stand, the massacre there. Uh, many times he would help the government, work out a treaty, both sides would sign, and then it would be broken. 
by, sadly, by the American government. And then that would lead to need for another treaty and uprisings and so forth. Uh, I think he was a counselor to four different presidents, including Abraham Lincoln. But there was, uh, there is a sad note to that. After he died, after Father DeSmet died, one American president, Ulysses S. Grant, gave most of the Catholic missions that the Jesuits and other orders had started, gave them to Protestants. And one, one of the interesting things is when Father DeSmet was first evangelizing the Indians, they wanted the black robe because he didn't have a wife. They didn't want Protestant missionaries. There were Protestant missionaries who traveled among the Indians and taught them Christianity. But for the most part, the Indians wanted the black robes. They wanted Catholicism. One uh, very interesting um, fact for me, for us in this area, is that of all the tribes that they evangelized, the Jesuits found that the most faithful, the most uh, devout and persevering were the Coeur d'Alene Indians. And of course, some of you have been before in past Fatima conferences to the Sacred Heart Mission, which I mentioned St. Mary's being the first settlement in Montana, the Sacred Heart Church in um, Cataldo there, the Coeur d'Alene Mission, was the first building erected in Idaho and still stands. A testimony to Father Ravalli, who was the architect and builder, and the Indians who put that building up. Sadly, one of the things that happened, and this happened at St. Mary's Mission in Montana, is that there would be these white fur trappers who were traveling around the West, and they heard about this comfortable mission, had houses and heat, etc., and so they went there in the winter time, and they wanted to stay for three months in the coldest months of the winter. Well, of course, the Jesuits, being hospitable, gave them hospitality, gave them a place to stay. But then these trappers would give the Indians some bad habits, gambling or whatever it was, and they undermined the work of the missionaries. And one of the greatest um, trials for the, the priests was when these travel, travelers would give the Indians whiskey or what they referred to as fire water. Their constitution could not handle, break down the alcohol, even a small amount, and would make them completely crazy. And sadly, this undermined to a great degree the work of the missionaries. One year in his younger life, Father DeSmet, who I must, whom I might say was a very man of very strong constitution. When he was a boy, his classmates called him Samson because of his, his, his strength. So at any rate, one day he went on to a, uh, a uh, boat, a uh, paddle wheel boat on the Mississippi, and this boat was going up or was going to go up the Missouri. And he saw there a cask of whiskey on the boat. And being filled with a zeal, he grabbed an ax and he destroyed it right then and there. And he almost did not escape with his life because you can imagine these non-Catholic merchants who were very angry at the amount of money they lost in that. But he didn't care because he knew that it would undermine his work among the Native Americans. So as I said, the, to getting back to that point, the Coeur d'Alene Indians were considered the most devout. They held on to the faith more strongly. In fact, Father DeSmet said that they had to be curbed the zeal, the, the, the penance they wanted to do, the amount of, of uh, penitential works, they had to be held back because they were so filled with zeal. So that's a, a bright spot for us in this area. And again, all of these other uh, missions go back to Father DeSmet and the various Indian tribes. It, th this book, as I, as I mentioned, is just absolutely fascinating. But a couple of anecdotes that I remember, he was traveling one time, and it was wintertime, it was cold, and there was a rainstorm or snow, whatever, and he thought, I need some shelter. He went up, and there was this hollowed-out tree. He climbed up, and he's going down the tree, and what did he find at the bottom? Two bear cubs. Well, you know what that means. So he was hardly settled in there when he heard the claw of the mother going up on the outside of the tree, and then she started to come down the old tree rear end first. But the bear was so wide, it took up, so how is he going to escape? He grabbed the tail of the bear and yanked it so hard, and the mother bear just went up, didn't know what that was, and took off. 
And so he escaped with his life that day. But amazing. There was another time when there was an Indian who was furious at him because this man was pagan. He might have been one of the witch doctors or whatever. And he was telling other Indians that he, when he had the chance, he was going to kill Father DeSmet. And one day he had his chance. Father DeSmet was on a horse. This Indian started running at him wildly with his tomahawk. Father DeSmet jumped down. And before he knew what happened, he advanced and hit him so hard he knocked that Indian flat on the ground. Then he took his tomahawk and stood over him with his foot on him, and he wouldn't let him up until the Indian promised that he would tell the other Indians what happened to him. <laughs> so <laughs> Father DeSmet was very capable of handling himself. I'm going to uh, show you a few slides. Um, we just have a few that I put together. This is, I think, a painting. I don't think it's an actual photograph. This is a painting of Father DeSmet, probably when he was in his mid-40s or so would be my guess. I want to go back. Um, this one shows uh, Indian leaders, uh, chiefs, and the uh, two uh, treaties that Father Desmet is most known for were the Treaty of 1851, I'm not sure the name of that, and then the Treaty of Fort Laramie, which was 1868. So I believe this photo, an actual photograph, was taken after, at the conclusion of one of those treaties with the Indians who had signed for their tribes. This is an actual photograph of Father Desmet later on in his life. Uh, you can see him there with his cassock. The Jesuits have the, the rosary on the, the belt on the side and a crucifix that he wore around his neck. And then the picture I had showed you earlier. Another picture of Father DeSmet next to a globe of the world. He, it is said that he had traveled in his life 180,000 miles. Now, that doesn't seem too much to us anymore when we can travel by air travel. But that was all calculated from all his trips across the Atlantic and by foot and horseback all over the Rocky Mountain region. This is the statue that was taken down at St. Louis University. Notice what he's holding in his left hand, very high, aloft. He's holding the cross, indicating what he taught the Indians, the doctrine of the cross, redemption, uh, the teachings of the Catholic religion. You have one Indian, a chief, you know, in a head headdress, over here, and you have another one kneeling that's mostly out of the picture, and that's what really bothered the multiculturalists. And so they said, if you can imagine the words again that the, uh, the professor that talked about why they decided to remove it said, he said it signified Christian and white supremacy. So they think Christian supremacy. You see, their attitude is, oh, he came to convert the Indians to take them away from their idyllic, you know, beautiful way of life. Well, they were fighting among one another constantly, and he came to give them the faith and lead them to salvation. So here's a picture of that statue being taken down. That, By the way, uh, it's rumored, I haven't heard, but they were going to replace it with something to deal with Ferguson. You know the riots in Ferguson? I think the young man that was killed or something like that. And I'm serious. That's what, that's what the original talk was, but I don't know what happened from there. Now, these are just just different pictures that I want to show you that we were able to obtain from archives on the Internet from the 1800s and early 1900s to show you what a lot of different religious orders did among the Indians to civilize them, to teach them the faith, and to help them to love God and our Blessed Mother. All the beautiful Indian schools. A group of Indian girls uh, in their school in the workroom this is one of some kind of a parade uh, of the Indian children being lined up and marching, etc., drilling. I don't know what the event was. It says, oh, it just gives the, uh, where the photo is from. This one you can see Canloop, Kamloops, British Columbia, for our Canadians out there, uh, 1934. You can see a very large Indian school, and look at all of those children. It looks like the occasion of a First Communion, if you notice the group of girls right behind the two priests, and then to the left of them, uh, the boys. Here's a, another group of girls. The sign that's somewhat cut off says, God sees me, and uh, looks to be like a high school uh, of girls taught by the sisters. And if, you can't, if you're trying to read the words across the middle of the paper, the picture, it's Marquette University Libraries. That's where they put that on their 
pictures in the library. Cute little picture, boys in an Indian boarding school in their dormitory learning to say their prayers before they go to bed. Another one, uh, this isn't only Indian children, as you can see, but some of them are learning to pray. This one is from, uh, for you Seattle people, this is from the Tulalip Indian tribe uh, in western Washington. It says uh, Tulalips, and I can't read all the words for the focus, but that one is from western Washington. Another cute picture of children, probably right after their first communion or maybe confirmation, and you can see the smiles, and you can just barely see behind them the two sisters, their teachers. Another one, um, I have some of these captions at home. I'm sorry I didn't bring them, but the, the uh, where this one was taken, I don't recall. But in the West, and I think this one was down in the area of Arizona. Uh, Yuma, something like that. Oops. Now what did I do? Okay. Um, another classroom with Indians, and you can see their bare feet under the tables. So, you know, they were poor, but... Very happy in these schools. Look at the size of that school, that academy, and how well-dressed they are, etc. So just, again, the work of the great missionaries. Here's another uh, workroom picture of girls. And are there some boys in there? Are they all, I look, yes, they're all girls in that one. Another, I can't tell whether this is a workroom or recreation room, but another group picture. See the picture of our late, or that's St. Joseph up on the right. Now, this one is a painting, obviously, probably done by Father, um, I guess it says by Francis Harper. Uh, but maybe the painting was done by um, Father Point. Father Nicholas Point was one of the, the very first followers of Father Dismet out here, and he put together, he was a painter, and he painted all these different scenes. But this is Father Dismet being welcomed into an Indian village, and they're carrying him on a blanket. So he made him sit on the blanket, and these braves are holding the edges of the blanket to welcome him into their village. Oh, well, that's it. So, so back to the beginning. So again, just a few um, photos to hopefully help us have an appreciation, not just of Father Dismet and the heroic work that he did among the Native Americans, but also all of the religious who followed him, who laid this foundation for these Indians who, whose hearts were open. And I want to conclude with um, the words of an Indian chief when Father Dismet first went to his village. He said, Black Robe, welcome to our country. Long have we desired to see you and be enlightened by your words. Our fathers worshipped the earth and the sun. I remember distinctly the day we first heard of the one and only true God. Since then, it is to him we have addressed our prayers and supplications. And yet we are much to be pitied. We do not know the teachings of of the great spirit and we sit in darkness but now I hope you have come to bring us light I have finished speak black robe every ear is open and eager to hear your words and indeed they were their hearts were open they were eager and they they absorbed the teaching now imagine father Desmet didn't speak their language so he had to use interpreters and Nevertheless, these Indians absorbed the teachings and they took the faith to heart. And in fact, it was, I think, the very first or second year after Father Desmet arrived at St. Mary's, founded the mission of St. Mary's, that our Blessed Mother appeared to an Indian youth in his teepee uh, and because he had a hard time remembering the catechism and he wanted to make his first communion. And Our Lady appeared to him and from that point on he knew everything in his catechism. So just, just marvelous stories about the faith coming to our area. We should be very proud of these great missionaries and try to emulate them and hold up the honor of their reputation, which has been so sadly, uh, their legacy, which has been so sadly misrepresented today. Thank you.